Hi, everybody. Um, it's 530 and we're just about to begin the third installment of construction history in New York and Chicago. Uh, once again, presenting Thomas Leslie and Don Friedman representing Chicago and New York. Um, and we've already welcomed um, 74 people on this Zoom. So we've, um, we have uh, the fans of, of the Tom and Don show who we've taught to be punctual because we certainly um, have had a tremendous amount of interest from I think all over um, in this series, which has only been growing, I'm sure with the reputation of how excellent the previous talks have been. Um, and um, if you have missed those first two talks, you can find them on our website. You can also find them on our YouTube channel. Um, and those first talks were on foundations, um, the page from our website that you see here, uh, as well as on frames. And tonight's talk about facades is working our way up the building and out upward to, to finish the building. Uh, and next week we'll be looking at fire uh, with four Fs um, in order to frame the alliteration of the series, but especially at building codes um, and other issues that may have developed differently in each city, but it certainly affected the development of the architecture and the urban um, scene um, in, uh, as a consequence. Uh, we'll preview a little bit of that tonight. But tonight in focusing on uh, facades, we will be um, joined by Joanna Merwood Salisbury, uh, uh, another scholar of Chicago. So we're kind of um, two against one, in the, especially in the expertise, but she, uh, Joanna has her uh, connections to New York, having taught for um, many years at uh, Parsons School of Design at the, at the New School, uh, and has also worked besides her book on Chicago 1890 on Union Square in New York, taking a perspective that is urban history and labor history in particular. So um, from those additional perspectives on the historical period of our study here in the late 19th century and through the first couple of decades of, of the 20th, Joanna is going to be posing some questions as the commentator um, after the two present presentations. But I've also asked her at the beginning of our session um, to uh, frame some of the issues about the first Chicago school, because what we've been doing so far in focusing on the technological developments, the materials um, um, improvements uh, in the building construction of the skyscraper, the issues that we've um, looked into from especially structural engineering um, and architectural design, but from the, from the practical construction history point of view, um, have been complicating a story which previously had been very simplified and reductive um, in the years of architectural history, at least that I studied. And that is the framing of the first Chicago school. Um, and I'm going to go forward through my slides here. Um, first showing you again, the covers of the books by uh, Tom and Don, uh, Tom Chicago skyscrapers, uh, um, and then Don Friedman's The Structure of Skyscrapers in America. And I'm going to re um, remind myself to tell you and to remind you to buy the books. Um, you can do that by looking in the chat feature of the Zoom where we've put the, the links to the publisher site or, um, or another bookstore um, book purveyor uh, site so that you can easily uh, acquire um, these books. Um, Don's book is published by uh, APT. Uh, it is a little difficult to get, but uh, APT wants you to know that you can buy it directly from their website. And we put the, the um, link into the chat. So to, in order to make that easier. And for those New Yorkers, I'd like to mention that you can now also come to the Skyscraper Museum where we have a, um, a hearty stock um, in supply in our bookstore. Um, the other feature that we are asking you um, to maybe use the chat for tonight, and if you're not familiar with it, you'll find it um, usually at the icons in the bottom of your Zoom screen, uh, where um, we're, we're interested to know where you're watching from tonight. We think we've de been developing an audience far beyond the, um, the immediate lo metropolitan locales of New York and Chicago. Chicago. And so we'd like to learn where you're from um, uh, and um, to hear 
um, more of your thoughts, which you can do by emailing the skyscraper directly or put, uh, put questions into the chat um, tonight for tonight's program. And I'll be talking more uh, next week about some kind of roundtable session to um, synthesize um, or, uh, or um, uh, you know, analyze the findings over these first four weeks of the Tom and Don show. Um, and then in, in addition, the CODA on um, the fifth week, uh, about, which will be delivered by Alexander Wall, uh, Wood, excuse me, who um, is also going to be the commentator next week in order to segue into his own talk on, um, on the Mills building in New York, a building of the 1880s. So um, I've now taken too long in my pref preface. I want to show the cover of um, Joanna Merwood Salisbury's book on Chicago, Chicago 1890, that you see here. Um, and I'm going to invite um, Joanna to come onto the screen now. And she's going to share her screen in order to talk a little bit about this background of the Chicago school and its historiography, um, which I am suggesting with the cover of um, this book on um, the rise of the Chicago skyscraper series by Carl Condit of Chicago. So, um, so here is Joanna who will be followed by the presentation by Don Friedman um, and then by Tom Leslie. Um, so Joanna, take it away, thank you. Thank you so much, Carol. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and it's a great pleasure to have uh, listen to the previous talks in this series, um, really fascinating uh, material from um, Tom and Don. Um, I'm particularly uh, excited to be introducing the session on facades because obviously it's in the facade that the public really gets to see the building. Um, and it's also in art and architectural history terms that this is where the rivalry between um, New York and Chicago really begins. Um, the rivalry turns not on only on which city was the first um, to employ the steel frame. This is a, a kind of debate that Tom and, and Don comprehensively unpacked in the last session, but also which city was the first to develop an aesthetic language that properly expresses the new frame technology uh, on the exterior of the building. And it's that question um, that the, the category of the Chicago School of Architecture turns on. The idea that in the 1890s, a group of Chicago architects developed a kind of aesthetic expression for interior technology that was really uh, innovative and transformative. So what I wanna do just very briefly is um, talk a little bit about the history of that narrative, uh, starting in uh, New York in the 1920s and the 1930s. Um, in 1927, the very influential critic Lewis Mumford wrote an article called New York versus Chicago in Architecture. And he made the point that although um, New York was producing a large number of, you know, incredibly amazing, technologically sophisticated uh, skyscrapers, such as the Barclay Vesey building uh, that you can see here in the left slide, um, and others. Um, European critics and architects were less interested in what was happening in New York at the time than they were in what had been happening in Chicago in the 1880s and the 1890s. And he referred to some of the very influential European uh, critics and architects who he had been corresponding with, Eric Mendelssohn, Walter Berendt, uh, and others. And he mentioned that they were far more interested in a building like the Monadnock than they were in any New York skyscraper even though the Monadnock uh, completed in the early 1890s was quite old by this period. Um, for Europeans, it seemed to be more modern than what New York was producing. Just a few years later um, in 1931, the um, curator and architect Philip Johnson made the same point in an essay called The Skyscraper School of Modern Architecture. Um, and he was quite, uh, critical in this essay of what was happening in New York. And he used the example in particular of the Shelton Hotel um, as a sort of wrong turn in the history of the skyscraper. He said, uh, this building uh, not only expresses a kind of um, ornamental decorative um, 
top that he thought was totally inappropriate to, to the new way of building. But it, the fact that it was a steel building, but it seemed to be masonry meant that it was a, an invalid expression of uh, skyscraper technology. And he too uh, compared it to the Monadnock, this much older Chicago building saying the Chicago school, as it was becoming known, had produced a type that was more honest uh, and in fact, beautiful uh, in its expression of um, building technology. In 1933, uh, Philip Johnson and Henry Russell Hitchcock uh, mounted a show at the Museum of Modern Art uh, on early modern architecture in Chicago, in which they really reinforced this message and sort of cemented it in the public imagination, the idea that uh, the Chicago architecture of that period, the 1870s to 1910, was in fact America's modern architecture, more modern than what was happening in New York. Um, the image, I think Carol's shown this before, of Philip Johnson uh, next to a series of models produced for the exhibition illustrating what was described as an evolution uh, from masonry to steel construction and claiming that Chicago had been the city in which this evolution was uh, first carried out and also best expressed uh, aesthetically. And I just want to note that um, Johnson and Hitchcock were very much uh, dependent for the information on Chicago on Thomas Talmadge, who uh, was one of the authors of the report that had claimed the home insurance building was the first uh, skeleton building. It's a topic that uh, was covered in the last lecture. Interestingly, in the 1933 MoMA show, uh, only two New York buildings were included, and they were um, included to make a very specific point. Uh, in Hitchcock and Johnson's eyes, uh, New York had made an incredible start in the innovation of the use of metals in construction with the work of James Bogardus, um, not a skyscraper, but um, very innovative in a, in a different way. Um, but in their eyes, uh, New York had uh, sort of evolved backwards or at least stagnated in its aesthetic expression of these new materials. And the negative example they gave is George Post's New York World Building. Um, which obviously uh, is innovative uh, structurally, but in fact has wears a kind of garb of historicism. It's still looking for its exterior expression um, to uh, the neoclassical style of the past rather than projecting forward to a new modern style. So this is the story of the Chicago school uh, being superior, more modern to what was happening in New York in the same time period. Um, Carol's talked about the historiography um, being cemented by Carl Condit in his writing about Chicago. I think um, an important figure that we shouldn't forget between uh, Hitchcock and Johnson and Condit is uh, Siegfried Gideon. Um, in his Space, Time and Architecture from 1941, he explicitly paired um, D.H. Burnham's Reliance Building with Mies van der Rohe's project for a glass skyscraper, um, claiming that the Reliance is a sort of prefiguration of this uh, image of a modern transparent glass skyscraper um, that Mies was to go on to become uh, so famous for, um, for giving form to. So just to kind of wrap up my brief introduction, um, the kind of mythology of the Chicago school that's established in 1941, um, says that the early Chicago skyscraper is in contrast with New York, um, both technically and aesthetically, uh, a positive contrast, um, that it is uh, beginning to become divorced from the negative influence of, of historicism, that it is structurally rationalist, um, it's form is drawn from its interior structure, and that uh, symbolically it's both truly American and also truly modern, being the anticipation of the work that the European avant-garde would produce in the 1920s. Since so much of the story rests on the kind of history of building technology, um, 
series like this one are so vital in helping us revise this narrative to question its veracity to add new layers of complexity to it um, and i know that uh, tom and don's work is incredibly important in that revision so i'm going to pass over now to to don to uh tell us um give us some more complexity to the story thank you joanna let me just get my screen sharing going here okay um so as the only person uh, who you're going to be seeing talk tonight who has no formal training in architecture um i i already said in our internal discussion that i intend to uh, run away screaming from any discussion of architectural style um that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist and, and i'm going to have some pictures where it sort of is right in your face uh, but I want to start with um, building code requirements for, for walls, uh, which are something that existed in, in both cities, obviously. Um, New York's were, frankly, backward uh, and remained backward for quite some time. Um, and these illustrations from the 1892 building code give you a sense of it. Um, the, the first thing it says in very large letters there, warehouse walls, but if you read below that, Warehouses are everything but dwellings, churches, theaters, and schoolhouses. So office buildings are warehouses, according to this uh, classification. Um, and what you've got is a requirement that the wall be at least 16 inches thick, absolute minimum. Uh, it increases by four inches every two feet or 25 feet of height, whichever is shorter. Uh, every, sorry, every two floors or 25 feet uh, in height, whichever is shorter. Uh, so uh, at four stories, it's 20 inches thick. At six stories, it's 24 inches thick. And what this is showing you is that if you have a 150-foot uh, a tall building, the walls are three feet thick at the base. Um, 100 feet was not all that tall by 1892. Uh, and there are plenty of buildings where the, uh, the, the walls were much more than three feet thick, particularly since there was a requirement that if you didn't have a solid wall. In other words, if you had windows, if you had a street facade, um, you had to take the material that wasn't part of the wall because there was an opening and redistribute it on either side. So if you had a wall that was supposed to be three feet thick and it was 50% window, uh, then it was going to be six feet thick where it was in between the windows. Um, so this is, this, this is a very conservative requirement. Now, this is for bearing walls, and they actually, they're nice enough to show the beams bearing on the wall on the left side there. Um, the 1892 code, and I'm going to give a summary of the code at the, the end, so uh, just to sort of go over this. The 1892 code was the first one that recognized that not all buildings had beams bearing on the walls. And <clears throat> that may seem a little bit late in the game, but it isn't really. Uh, the first skeleton frame buildings were only two years old in 1892, uh, and the first uh, cage frame buildings, ones where there was a metal frame supporting the floor beams and the exterior walls were self-supporting, those were only those were less than 10 years old. Those were maybe seven or eight years old in 1892. Um, so that's moving relatively fast as building codes go. Um, the uh, picture on the right and the text on the right is describing what you, what you do if the wall is not supporting beams. And it's a little bit better. It's unfortunately a little bit hard to read, I guess. Uh, the wall can be as thin as 12 inches at the top 50 feet, and it increases by four inches for every 50 feet or four stories below that. Uh, so it's a substantial savings, actually. Um, it doesn't seem like it to us because you still get very thick walls. Uh, in, in the picture shown here in a, in a, uh, a 200 foot tall building, you still have two foot thick walls at the base. And that is, that is a very thick brick wall. Um, this is, and, and uh, Joanna was nice enough to put up a picture of the world building. Uh, these are sections through the walls of the world building uh, as it was constructed. And I actually used this exact same slide for foundations um, because recycling is a good thing. If you look at the rear facades of the building, so uh, the, the, this is a series of, of sections through different walls. This is not what a piece, any one piece of the building would look like. <clears throat> if you look at um, the fourth section from the left, the one marked wall N-O, uh, 
Um, that looks a great deal like the code requirement. The wall is, is stepping four, four inches, four inches, four inches again, as you come down the building. And the reason that the number is four inches, by the way, for people who are not uh, in, in the, uh, the design and construction community, is that one width of brick, a wall is so many thicknesses of brick and one of them is four inches. So you increase, the logical way to increase the thickness of a wall is by adding another thickness of brick, adding another four inches. So if you look at the section marked NO, if you look at the section marked T at the bottom marked U, they all show that same pattern. Um, and it's very close to what the code required. Uh, there was no reason to do more than that. If you look at the sections on the left, um, the ones marked E, F, and K, uh, they don't have the pattern quite as clearly, and they're much thicker. And the reason is that those are street facades. And uh, if you remember what the building looked like from five minutes ago, it had extremely ornate street facades. Uh, and the, 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 uh, the bluish marked areas are stone, by the way. The, red, the, the, the pink is supposed to be brick, the, the blue is stone. Those are ornate street facades. And they have a great deal of relief to them. They have a lot of thickness uh, in the visible portion of the wall. And since you can't build less than the code required, the only way to have that relief, the only way to have a lot of difference between the thinnest portion of the wall and the thickest portion of the wall is to build outwards. So the wall gets thicker to add that ornament. Um, and that's why the street facades don't show, the, they're thicker than they have to be to carry the ornament. So it does, there's, you don't see the code reflected in the wall so clearly. You, what you see is rather the architecture reflected in the thickness of the wall. Um, a question that came up several years ago, actually, while I was uh, giving a talk at the museum, was uh, if the New York City code required these thick walls, then how could anybody ever build anything different? And all New York buildings from that era must have thick walls. And the answer is, that's the requirement. It's not necessarily what was actually built. And I'm gonna use as an example, the building on the right, which is 12-16 John Street. It still exists. Uh, it was known as the Anderson Building for a long time. Um, and uh, I, I feel a certain uh, proprietary interest in this building. If you look at the, the, the uh, it's not a letter, it's a building department form on the left. The engineer is S.C. Weisskopf. And my first job was at Weisskopf and Pickworth, the firm that, that uh, Samuel Weisskopf founded a little bit before 1900. Um, he was the engineer for, the, for this building and he was one of the pioneering engineers for buildings. In other words, and I've said this in a couple of the previous talks, uh, prior to the changes in building technology, you didn't really need structural engineers for buildings. Structural engineers were, were mostly working in civil work, bridges and such. Um, but as soon as you start introducing complicated metal frames into buildings, you need an engineer. And Weisskopf was one of the first to make that transition uh, to doing just building work. Um, the building department, this is 1897. In 1897, all, all through the 1890s, the building department had a standard form that you would fill out uh, when, you would, when you were planning a building. And it was, that form was based on the common buildings in New York, which had brick bearing walls and wood joist floors. <clears throat> it's worth remembering, 1897, there was, a, there was a lot of interest in new construction in skeleton frame buildings. Steel skeleton frame buildings were a hot thing in New York in 1897. There were a couple of dozen of them built. And there were in the same year, several thousand buildings built in the city most of which had brick bearing walls and wood joist floors. So as much as we talk about uh, you know, this, this change in technology that led to skyscrapers, um, it was not what was commonly being built. Most buildings were small and most buildings had wood joist floors. So the, the standard form that you would submit to the building department was based on that construction. It said, what's the thickness of your brick walls? What size joist do you have? There was really no way to put the information for a steel frame onto that form. And going through these forms uh, while doing research, people did different things. They would, they would cross out the word joist and write, you know, eight inch wrought iron beams or eight inch steel beams. They would find ways to sort of jimmy the, the structural information into a form that was not meant for it. And eventually in the, the late 1890s, they gave up and they started writing C attached drawings. And that's one of those moments where, where you see something change in technology. 
uh, it was the birth of the structural drawing for buildings. Um, and this happened simultaneously in New York and in other, in other cities. But there it is, is that they could no longer put building structure on the architectural drawings. They could no longer fit it on the form. It required its own drawings to transmit the information. Th this thing on the left here is another form, and it is a request from the designers of a building and the owner of a building that is being planned uh, to, for a variance. In other words, to be allowed to ignore a piece of the code, and you have to give a reason for it. And the piece of the code that they specifically wanted to ignore was they wanted to make the walls thinner than, they, than the code required. So this is a blow up of a piece of it. Um, the, the first paragraph is interesting, and this is back to our, uh, our first discussion on foundations. Um, this particular site on John Street, uh, bedrock is 80 feet below the sidewalk. Um, which would make a foundation on rock expensive. However, that there, there's good material higher up, compact sand and gravel. They want to keep the foundation loads down because they will be sitting on sand and gravel rather than on bedrock. And they want to use, they, they want, we see no other choice for decreasing this load, the, the weight of the building, other than to make the non-bearing walls as thin as possible. The entire structure above the second floor is carried on the steel construction, and the structure would be perfectly safe if the walls of the first story and below were entirely omitted. That's a good definition of a skeleton frame building, right? We look upon these walls, therefore, as mere curtain walls and see no reason why they should be built any thicker than the dimensions specified above, which is to say 16 inches. And we trust that the amendment we asked for will be granted by your board of examiners. They don't, they, they're asking for a variance from the building code. So they're not guaranteed they will get this. They did get it. What's interesting is that I've come across many versions of this same form. Um, and it, what it boils down to is the people building skeleton frame buildings knew that they didn't need the walls getting thicker. And you know, in this case, they're saying it was to keep the foundation costs down. Maybe that was true. Maybe the owner simply didn't want to pay for all that extra brick. It's hard to say 120 years after the fact. Uh, but it is known that, th that this kind of variance was frequently granted. So it's not necessarily true that just because the code requires something, it's what is commonly being done. Um, this is not a skyscraper by anybody's standards. This is the, the, the Gorham building uh, by McKim, Mead and White. Um, on Fifth Avenue, and I, I always forget if it's 35th or 36th Street, I think it's 36th. Uh, in the modern photograph on the right, you see the Empire State Building in the background. Uh, Gorham, this, is, this was a department store. The Gorham Company uh, started off in, in metal work. Um, and it's, you know, this, this is your classic American Renaissance building. Uh, amusingly enough, uh, a style that was popular, popularized by the Chicago World's Fair in 1893 which then Chicago didn't build as much of as other cities. Um, and in, in the 60s, the Fifth Avenue facade was altered, as you see on the right. Uh, the arcade was removed um, for, for the Fifth Avenue facade and turning the corner onto the side street and a sort of chintzy uh, glass curtain wall put in its place. Um, I suspect it was the curtain wall was removed because they wanted to have bigger storefronts and for whatever reason decided to take the, the wall out up to the third floor or water table rather than just at the, at the storefronts. Um, the reason that I, I stare at this building every time I walk by it, uh, if you look on the side street facade, just to the right of the green caf W Cafe sign, um, you've got a piece of an arch. Um, you, you're, you've got something that's literally impossible. Uh, arches produced horizon produce horizontal thrust and you cannot cantilever a piece of an arch. It doesn't work in masonry. Um, so you're seeing something that's impossible if the arcade were actually an arcade. But the fact that you can remove that big piece of facade and you have the very heavy masonry above um, sitting on a, a single pane of glass at the, at the second floor is evidence that this, you're, what you're seeing is not real. Um, this is, a, a, to use a phrase that was commonly used by people who are fans of the Chicago School of Architecture, this is a stage set. Uh, this is not what it looks like it is. And I'm not sure anybody ever believed it's what it looks like it is. Um, here's another example. I'm gonna come back to other examples of that, but here's another example of sort of, you know, these things are not so simple when you get right down to it. The, the, the building that is in the center of this photograph, we see the side, the side facade there, uh, is the, the Park Row building, the 15 Park Row. Uh, 
for what it's worth, the tallest building in the world from 1899 to I think 1907. Um, it was put it was put up on a block full of uh, mid 19th century low rise buildings, masonry bearing walls, and wood joist floors. Those buildings were recently demolished. This photograph is about uh, three or four years old, um, and several modern high rises built in their place. Um, the, the Park Row building is a steel skeleton frame building, and the, the side facade sure looks like it. Um, but you've got that big area of facade that is blank. Uh, and the reason it's blank is that is an 1840s or 50s party wall that is embedded permanently in the side of the Park Row building. Um, when they built the Park Row building, they didn't want to make the building narrower to avoid the party wall. So they used the, the old party wall as their enclosure, the steel columns inside run past it. And they began the Park Row building's wall at about the fifth floor level. When the old buildings were demolished, whatever it was, five years ago or so, um, the party wall had to stay because if you remove that old party wall that no longer has a building attached to it, uh, you'd be exposing the interior of the Park Row building, which is generally considered to be a bad thing to do. Um, so you've got, if you go there today, you've got the 1899 Park Row building, you've got a 2018, 2019 high rise next to it. And in between the two, you have a wall that is from the, that is now something like 170 years old. Uh, so even though the Park Row building is a skeleton frame building and Pretty much all of the masonry is, is supported on the, on the steel frame. Uh, it has this piece of bearing wall permanently embedded in it um, because of a common New York phenomenon, which is the, the adjacent building with a party wall uh, that predates the, the, the skeleton frame building you're trying to build. <clears throat> um, back to the Gorham building. The arrows are mine. Uh, this is a, uh, McKinney and White put out a, uh, a monograph, I think around 1910 or so, that has a lot of their buildings. Um, if you're a fan of their work, it's great for the pretty pictures. If you're interested in how they built these complicated uh, classical facades, they have details of it. So we see on uh, the uh, most of this page, the, the upper left, more than a quadrant, um, the, the corner of the building at Fifth Avenue and, and the side street. So this we know we know now that all of that masonry up to the water table was removed in the 1960s for the, the glass curtain wall. Um, to the right of that, we have a section through the wall. Uh, the blue arrow is showing you how the second floor is supported and it's supported on a steel beam. You can just make it out behind the arcade. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the red arrow is pointing to a double beam that's supporting the wall at the water table. So the arches are not supporting the water table or anything above. Uh, they're not supporting the second floor. They are in short supporting nothing but themselves. Uh, they're, they're very pretty to look at and they are in theory very strong. Um, you could put a lot of load on that masonry arch, but there isn't. Uh, they are there purely for the architectural formal aesthetic, uh, not as, as part of the structure. Um, if you look at the bottom, directly below the elevation is a planned section. And the two green arrows, right at the tip of each of the green arrows, you see a little square uh, with flanges. And th those are the built up steel columns that, that are supporting, that are part of the skeleton frame. Um, and the, on the right, you've got the corner column. And on the left, you've got the column for the, the first uh, pier in of the, the arcade. Um, and if you look at the amount of masonry in those piers versus the amount of steel, Back to what I was saying two weeks ago, uh, this is a steel frame built, a steel skeleton frame building. The steel frame was designed to carry all of the load. And the fact that the masonry could be removed in the way that it was proves that they are capable of carrying the load. So the, the intent and the current reality match up. But in between those two, there was the, the 55 or so years where you had all that masonry and it obviously was carrying load because how could it not? The masonry is so much stiffer than the steel adjacent to it, it will carry load. So it's an interesting thing where you have the intent, the as-built condition and the altered condition. And the altered condition is actually closer to the original intent than the as-built condition was. Another McKinmead and White building, this one I think actually qualifies as a skyscraper. Um, this is 60 Broadway, uh, they're calling it the Columbia Trust Building. It was later on known as the Knickerbocker Trust Building. 
um, long since demolished. Uh, you've got the overall facade on the left, and I'm going to be looking at the, uh, the first few floors, um, and that's a blow up of that on the right. And uh, in my next slide is going to be a close up on the upper right hand portion of this slide. So the, the, if you look at the close up elevation on the right, um, the fourth floor has relatively small windows above the big set of, of uh, Corinthian piers, Corinthian columns and piers. So this is that blow up, this is that upper corner. Um, and there's the illustration in the monograph as it appears on the left and on the right, I've made it either easier to read or more difficult to read depending on how you feel about these things. Um, here's my color code. The, the green represents uh, floor beams and horizontal steel that's running left to right in the same plane as the, the page. The red represents the beams that are running perpendicular to the page in and out towards us. Uh, the purple are hangers that are there solely to support terracotta. So um, unlike the Gorham building where a lot of the ornament was stone at uh, Columbia Trust, uh, the ornament is, is terracotta, hollow, hollow architectural terracotta. So if you look at the, the fifth floor, we'll start at the upper portion of this. Um, you've got the floor beams that support the floor coming into a very large built up um, I-beam that is the, the main spandrel beam. And that main beam is, in, is at the plane of the wall. It's directly over a window, for example. But you've got this huge, this huge water table projecting out past that. And it's made out of architectural terracotta. This is a steel frame building. You can't just cantilever the masonry. So what they've done is they have two secondary spandrel beams, the double channel on the upper left and a single channel right next to the main spandrel beam. And they have brackets, which is that green beam connecting the two red beams um, to hold everything together. Then they hang the terracotta off of that. So what you've actually got, if you, strip, if you stripped off the terracotta ornament, you would have a very simple pseudo-modern facade. Um, but the architectural intent here was to have the ornate facade. So a lot of steel has been added to make it happen. Um, the, the engineers at the time would probably have had much easier lives if the facades were simpler, if this was something closer to a modern building. Uh, but it was their job to provide support for what the architect was, was doing for purposes that obviously the owner agreed with since they paid for it. Um, if you look at the, the fourth floor, you have something similar going on. You have the floor beams coming across to a, a spandrel beam. You have a secondary spandrel beam, a channel that's outboard of that. And then you have a whole series of hangers to hold up the soffit because they, they, there's, those, there's that set of large piers. Go back here. There's this set of large piers here. So we have an exposed outdoor soffit between those piers out of architectural terracotta and all of that, that purple material, all those uh, steel hangers are there to hold up that terracotta because masonry doesn't want to be floating in midair. Two views from the spring of 1912 of the Woolworth building under construction. Um, and this is uh, an, all, an all terracotta facade as far as what you see. The backup for the terracotta is brick. Um, and what's interesting here is the, the frame of the Woolworth building was built at a pretty good pace, um, not amazingly fast, but reasonably fast for the era and certainly for the size of the building. And if you look, you see that the masonry work is pretty much keeping pace with it. Uh, the, the, this is a very ornate terracotta facade but most of the terracotta facade is simply spandrel panels and piers. And it's very repetitive. And as a result, they were able to build it quite, quite rapidly. Um, the portion, if you look at the picture on the right, you've got the poor, there are two portions of facade that aren't built yet. And it's the top of the tower where obviously they haven't caught up to the steel framing yet. But the other one is the top of the main block of the building at the base of the tower. Uh, and the reason that that is taking longer is that that is much more ornate than the typical floors. The typical floors are pretty straightforward. The top of the, the main block and the top of the tower are not. Those are much more complicated. So what, what you're seeing here is that the ordinary masonry, the field of the wall, or in this case, the field of a set of piers, is easy to build. It is the, the thing that everybody has been doing all of the time. Uh, and it's not, it's not difficult in using the technology of that era to do. Um, so there, there are several things coming together here. You have 
uh, architectural expectations uh, and sort of public expectations for what the building looks like. Um, but you also have people reverting to what's the thing they're comfortable doing. And people in New York in 1912, just as they had been in 1900 or in 1890, were comfortable building a lot of masonry. It was the way buildings had always been built. And there was not, at that time, any particular reason to change. Uh, one last comment on the picture on the right. Um, the tallest building you see other than the Woolworth building is the Singer building off in the distance. And to the left of that, you see a building with two uh, turrets on the roof. That's the Park Row building, um, which a few years earlier had been the tallest building in the world. And it's just over half the height of the Woolworth building, which gives you a sense of how fast building heights were increasing. Um, how long did this keep going? Well, the, the, this is the Con Ed building uh, at, at Union Square. Um, and we're looking at the back of it, uh, facing Third Avenue. And the, this building was built in sort of in several campaigns. The, um, the, south, the south wing, which is what we're looking at here, that the very ornate facade you see on the left in the left-hand picture is the south wing. Uh, was built in the 1920s, and it was built in what was by then a very backward looking architectural style, but it was built in that style to match the rest of the building. Um, the building is currently, oh, I, this is actually uh, two summers ago, undergoing facade repair, um, not one of my projects, so I'm just telling you what I could see from the street. Um, I've blown up the picture on the right, and you see you know, that you've got this very ornate masonry facade, but it's, it's really, it's paper thin. Um, it, you know, the, the masonry facade is where it's in, passing in front of the steel uh, at most eight inches and most of it's more like four inches thick. So we're back to that, 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 that uh, word that was meant as, or that, that phrase that was meant as an insult, uh, it's a stage set, um, it sort of is. Uh, it, it is not a structural wall, it was not intended as a structural wall, um, and that shows in how it was built. So this shows you how slow people in New York were to really catch on to, people in writing New York City building code were to catch on to what it means to build a skeleton frame. Uh, Joanna showed earlier um, a picture of the Lang stores and, and the, the idea that was popular certainly in the 1930s and continued to be popular um, at least uh, through the, the 80s when I was uh, first exposed to architectural history that cast iron facades were the first step towards, um, towards skyscrapers. Well, the 1882 New York City Building Code, which is arguably the first comprehensive code in the city's history. There were building laws before that, but the 1882 code starts to look like a building code as opposed to sort of a set of uh, disconnected rules. Uh, it outlawed exposed structural iron of any kind. Um, so that was the end of cast iron facades. Uh, if you see a cast iron facade building in New York, it was either built or in construction before 1882. Um, but 1892, as I previously mentioned, um, walls that did not support floor load were allowed to be substantially thinner. And that was a big savings. So, you know, one reason that, uh, as I talked about two weeks ago, New York was a little bit slow to go to commit to skeleton framing. A lot of hybrid structures were popular here. Um, is that the big savings in facade construction came with, eight, with eight, the 1892 code, which removed more than 50% of the masonry uh, from a wall if the wall didn't support floor load. Uh, it didn't give you any advantage to having the wall supported on the frame. Um, there, in other words, there was no economic advantage from this provision in having a skeleton frame as opposed to that, the hybrid cage form. Um, and therefore, it wasn't pushing you towards or away from that. Uh, 1901, and by 1901, people were building quite large skeleton frame buildings in New York. Um, it reduced the required wall thickness, but it still required the walls to get thicker towards the base of the building, which has no rational basis in, in a fur curtain wall in a skeleton frame building. But as I said earlier, um, it's not that people were ignoring this provision, they were explicitly asking for permission to not follow it, and they were being granted that permission, um, which suggests that there's a disconnect people in the design community and the plan examiners understood that this was not necessary. For whatever reason, the people writing the building code did not or want, or they wanted to be conservative for the sake of being conservative. Um, the 1916 code finally allowed you to build a curtain wall that was the same thickness to fill the full building height. It had to be 12 inches thick, but you, you could 
you no longer had to make the walls thicker at the bottom by code. Uh, so they eliminated that sort of that class of uh, request for variances. Um, they also introduced the concept that masonry walls were something that were to be designed in the same manner as a steel frame. Uh, prior to this, the, the, the code really didn't talk about stresses in masonry. And this is the beginning of that, which is how we design masonry today. And the 1938 code, so we're now getting, we're, you know, 1938 is well after the Empire State Building was constructed. They finally allowed curtain walls to be only eight inches thick. Again, you had to uh, meet the stress requirements. You had to prove that it worked. Um, but that was, that was the last step prior to post-World War II, uh, allowing people to go to masonry, uh, to uh, metal and glass facades. And even then, the early metal and glass facades in New York still had masonry behind them. You still had to ask for a variance to not have to have the masonry. Uh, and in part, and this is a preview of next week, in part that was intended as a fire protection measure. Um, so now that I've given you this, this uh, sort of snail-like uh, progress in New York, Tom is going to give you some much more interesting discussion in Chicago. Uh, well, thanks, Don. Uh, what what I want to do is to sort of navigate between the um, what Joanna was talking about in terms of uh, the the sort of historiography of the Chicago School and the the, the nuts and bolts that, that Don was talking about. And my take on this is that the the, the standard history that um, we sort of think of when we think of uh, Chicago is that. You know, after the fire, there's this uh, sort of import of uh, incredible talent and, um, and entrepreneurship that reinvents the skyscraper, right? That takes these new materials and, and out of nowhere, kind of the home insurance and the Reliance building in particular sort of pop up. And that 20 years after the fire or so with the World's Columbian Exposition, uh, the, the, the kind of highfalutin architectural ideas from New York kind of infect the, the city's architectural climate. And you get this period where the buildings in New York and Chicago are to many kind of indistinguishable that, that Chicago kind of adopts uh, what's called mercantile classicism uh, sort of wholesale. Um, that's a, an incredibly tidy uh, story, um, but it, it, it doesn't bear the slightest bit of scrutiny because of course the Reliance building uh, was built in 1895, so 24 years after the fire, and actually three years after the Columbian Exposition. Uh, so uh, you know, the, 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 the principles of the Chicago School, the, the skeletal frame and the curtain wall were actually thriving uh, after the, the, um, the, the, the exposition. And the, the mercantile classical buildings that we think of as the sort of betrayal of the Chicago School didn't happen until almost a generation later. So I, I want to kind of, I like Joanna's term, unpack a little bit, first of all, where the reliance comes from as a, as a tectonic proposition. And then also to point out that the buildings of that later era, uh, instead of being a, a stylistic departure, were actually a, a kind of technical response to, to a very changed balance of, um, of resources uh, and, and needs. I wanna go back just quickly to the conclusions from last week when we were talking about building frames, the real benefit of the skeleton frame is that it condenses all of the structural functions that for hundreds of years, exterior walls had carried uh, in tall buildings. It condenses those functions onto the building frame itself. So a steel frame can not only carry the, the gravity loads down to the ground that a building experiences, but it can also take the what we call the lateral loads, the wind forces especially uh, that, that tend to rack a building or to, to tip it over. The steel frame, because it's a stiff, um, stiff kind of uh, hybrid of elements, can carry those loads as well down, down into the foundation. And once you've taken all of the structural responsibility off of the building skin, you're left with a broader range of opportunities of, of what to do with it. And Don, I think, has very effectively showed that the code, the kind of leftover uh, prejudices or assumptions about exterior walls really fueled uh, New York's building code. Um, but Chicago, uh, depending on your point of view, never had either as restrictive a building code, or if you're a New Yorker in the 1880s and 1890s, Chicago never had a, a responsible building code, uh, at least in the 1880s. And so it was never faced with this requirement for a, a thick jacket of, of masonry on the outside. Uh, 
Chicago architects responded to the skeleton frame by making their walls thinner. And these first three uh, buildings, the Tacoma, the, the, um, the Pontiac, and the Monadnock, all three of these were hybrids of uh, iron frames and uh, iron frames with, with brick, re uh, brick shear walls. But you can see that even as the responsibility kind of gets taken on to the frame and shear walls, and then with the Masonic Temple in 1892, one of the first buildings where all of the structural forces, both gravity and wind are taken by the metal frame. Even the Masonic Temple, while it has a thin, uh, thin exterior wall that's not performing any structural function, it's still largely a, a, a solid wall. The, the windows in it are, are relatively small. These are what were often called, especially by um, uh, New York critics, veneered construction, right? It has a, a kind of air of, of falsity or of uh, flimsiness to it. Um, to New Yorkers, these walls looked impossibly thin and, and probably dangerous from a, from, from a fire point of view, certainly uh, unattractive from an aesthetic point of view. They, they thought these buildings looked uh, like they were about to fall into the street. Um, but from our perspective, they still look in a lot of ways like masonry skyscrapers. Uh, the Monadnock was famous for being one, even though much of its interior structure was steel. The Masonic Temple, even though all of its interior structure was steel, uh, still uh, looks to our eyes today like a very, very solid uh, masonry and stone skyscraper on the exterior. So I, I want to, to talk about a, a particular geographical or, or really even geological quirk um, that made the reliance particular to Chicago and that made that glass facade, you know, 60 or 70% glass on the exterior, something that really economically uh, was, was almost sort of destined uh, to happen in Chicago instead of New York, and then sort of carry that theme up through the, through the later generation. To do that very quickly, uh, it, it, we need to look at the, the history of, of glass and plate glass in particular. Um, glass, of course, is a building material that was used since the Roman times to let light into, into buildings. But it really wasn't until the 18th century that plate glass or, or polished plate glass, as it's often called, um, was produced industrially. Uh, to do this, the plate glass has this surface that's almost perfectly smooth, and therefore the, the glass is almost perfectly transparent. It has none of the waviness that traditional hand-blown uh, window glass has. And to get that surface, to get that perfect finish requires an awful lot of work. Um, first of all, glass has to be uh, made in a furnace. So silica and other minerals have to be melted in a very, very hot furnace that requires a lot of fuel. Uh, first of all, coal and later natural gas. And then to, to polish that uh, rough plate glass down to something that is polished and transparent requires hours and hours and hours of grinding and then later polishing on tables that are designed to rotate the glass under basically scrubbers that take off, uh, in, in most cases, up to about half, a third or to a half of the glass's thickness to arrive at that perfectly smooth finish. Um, on the left is an 18th century version of this where all of it is done by hand. And gradually, 1895, 1901, you see that uh, mechanization takes place, which reduces some of the labor costs associated with making it. What that doesn't do, though, is reduce the fuel costs. And it's not until the 1880s when natural gas in Pennsylvania is first used to fire these plate glass furnaces that costs really begin to come down. Plate glass is a luxury material uh, until the 1880s and only really manufactured in quantities enough to bring down the prices uh, when uh, Pittsburgh plate glass uh, outside of Pittsburgh uses the natural gas resources of Pennsylvania to, to start to, to, to cheapen the, the process and therefore to make it uh, commercially available. Now that would partly explain using more and more glass on building facades, especially in an era when daylighting is still used for most of the, the office lighting or the, the interior illumination that goes on. And if you track the kind of evolution of the Chicago facade uh, through this, you see a kind of rough correlation that we go from solid structural brick facades like the Montauk over on the far left, the home insurance, which as we described last week is sort of a reinforced brick facades. You can imagine the, the windows sort of pushing their way out. And then the reliance, which almost doubles the amount of the percentage of glass uh, on the exterior from, from the home insurance. 
But that sort of gradual decline in, in prices isn't really enough to explain why the reliance happens exactly where it does in Chicago uh, instead of New York. And to do that, we have to look at the geography and particularly the economic geography and the, 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 the geology uh, of the Chicago region. Um, here in 1890, Scientific American, uh, sort of the third or fourth page on the inside, um, reports on the fact that natural gas had been discovered in central Indiana and that a company named Diamond Plate Glass had moved there to begin taking advantage uh, of, that, uh, of that resource. Here is the Diamond Plate Glass Company in Kokomo, Indiana. Um, it was, uh, the, the company was put together by uh, a couple of entrepreneurs who came from Pittsburgh, sort of refugees, uh, professional refugees from Pittsburgh Plate Glass. And their choice of Kokomo was very clever. Um, if you look at a geological map of Indiana uh, at the time, there's Chicago in the upper left. And here I've added uh, the outline of what was called the Trenton gas field. Uh, the, the discovery of the field in 1888 uh, led to a lot of industries moving to, to this part of Indiana. Uh, but the, the proprietors of diamond plate glass sort of looked at the map and, and made a very, very clever decision. They built two factories, one in Kokomo and one in Elwood. And these were, Kokomo especially was at the, the point in the gas field that was closest to Chicago, then the hottest commercial real estate market uh, in the country around 1890 and the run up to that 1892 uh, Chicago exposition or Columbian exposition. And both Kokomo and Elwood, the two towns where they built factories were on Pennsylvania Railroad's panhandle line, which went directly uh, to downtown Chicago. Um, I show Muncie on there as well, just as kind of proof that I'm, I'm, I'm not making this up. Uh, the, the Ball family uh, opened their uh, bottle and jar factory in Muncie at about the same time. And, and Ball State University in Muncie now is a kind of cultural fossil uh, of this gas boom and the glass industry uh, in central Indiana. Uh, this is the Sanborn map of Diamond Plate Glass's factory in Kokomo. Um, you can see it's in the red circle there, directly adjacent to the panhandle line. And it's a very, very neat drawing of the process that the, the furnaces are on the right, the grinding tables, 18 of them are in the middle, and then the warehouse and shipping is on the left. So it's an assembly line process, silica and, uh, and uh, other minerals come in from the right. They use the gas that's underground to fire the furnaces and then grind and polish and set it on the, the train on the way to, to downtown Chicago. The company was actually incorporated in Illinois, in, in Chicago, instead of in Indiana. And the board of directors were largely Chicago industrialists. So this is basically a suburb of Chicago, if, if you like, uh, economically. Um, the Kokomo plant was the largest plate glass plant in the world until the factory in Elwood was built. And here it is also on the Panhandle line up at the Northwest corner of the town. And you can see that it's substantially larger. It's 24 grinding tables instead of 18 grinding tables. They, these come online in 1892 and 1893. Uh, they produce more plate glass than any factories anywhere in North America or in fact the world. And they do this right in the teeth of the greatest depression that the United States has ever seen. Uh, after the Columbian Exposition, building in Chicago grinds to a halt. There are a handful of skyscrapers that are built between 1893 and about 1897, 1898. And Diamond Plate Glass has a warehouse full of plate glass and basically nowhere to sell it. Uh, as a result, the prices implode and Diamond Plate ends up going out of business in 1895. They're taken over by Pittsburgh Plate uh, in that year but not before they sell plate glass at, uh, at imploded prices to the few building projects that are going on. And the Reliance is one of these. And it's, it's interesting to note, it's not only a commercial skyscraper, but as you can see from the handwriting on the postcard, it was a very specific type of commercial skyscraper. It was designed uh, to house suburban doctors uh, to give them uh, examination rooms and treatment rooms where they could practice downtown during the day. So their clients could see them during the day and not have to, uh, not have to travel and see them uh, in, in the suburbs. As a business venture, this failed. It very quickly became just another commercial office building, but doctors needed even more daylight than, uh, than office workers. 
The Reliance was built at a time when glass was at its uh, implosive cheapest, not just in the country, uh, but throughout the throughout the uh, Chicago in particular. And the Reliance really took advantage of this, right? It is uh, sui generis. It, there's there's nothing like it. There's no economic condition quite like it. And I would argue that the Reliance, instead of being built as a kind of anticipation of the modern curtain wall, is built as a result of this very, very peculiar convergence of functional uh, and, and, and material influences. Um, the Reliance is also one of the first buildings to take uh, advantage of a new product called enameled terracotta, uh, which is advanced in Chicago, which already has a, a, a strong terracotta industry because of its position on the Chicago River, access to good clay beds. Uh, enameling just puts a, a, a sort of ceramic or glass coating on it that protects the terracotta uh, from weather. And as you saw in Don's uh, images, as you see here, uh, terracotta is like brick, but it's made from a, a, a much more uh, liquid clay. And that enables manufacturers to make thinner uh, sheets, thinner profiles that can more um, accurately both uh, reproduce uh, molded shapes, and as you see here, it can also um, wrap more uh, tightly around structural frames, for example, making it a more efficient material. And those two material um, uh, innovations are, I think, the, the things that complement the self-braced moment frame of the Reliance building. We talked about the Reliance's structural innovation last week. It's, it's one of the first buildings to take all of the lateral stability that comes from cross bracing uh, and distill that even further down into the joints and elements of the frame itself. And with that kind of incredibly minimal, literally skeleton frame, uh, it's also one of the first buildings to deploy such a thin and such a transparent curtain wall around the frame. So all of these things kind of converge on this one sort of uh, humble fail, almost failed business venture uh, in, in downtown Chicago. Um, as, as I said before, I think as interesting as the Reliance is, maybe the more modern version of that is, is built the next year under the same sort of economic conditions in, in 1896, uh, the Fisher Building, which is a few blocks south on, on Dearborn uh, and, and, uh, and Van Buren. And its frame is a little bit more regular than the Reliance's. Um, and that, to my mind, makes it look like uh, one of the, the, the first kind of modern, truly modern uh, uh, structural grids. Uh, but it also uh, had a, a unique kind of real estate situation where the Fisher's owners bought the air rights essentially over its smaller neighbor to the north. And so instead of the, the brick uh, curtain walls that protected the Reliance from its neighbors, I'll just go back really quick, um, maybe. The, the Reliance, as you can see on its on, on the top and, and the right of the slide, those are brick curtain walls that are, are firewalls to protect it from its neighbors. The Fisher Building uh, bought the rights and essentially only had to clad uh, its uh, its party wall in, in lightweight terracotta again. And this meant that the um, when the when Inland Architect reviewed the building, um, they were impressed most of all by the fact that the Fisher had almost no bricks in it. There were almost no bricklayers uh, employed on the, on the building. And this to Inland Steel was remarkable because it was, in their words, the first uh, building, first tall building erected literally without walls. And by walls, they meant uh, brick walls or, or masonry walls, all steel, all terracotta and glass. Um, again, this very unique uh, confluence of, of economic and, and geographic events um, combining to sort of produce what I think we look at now as a, as a, as a proto-modern uh, skyscraper. Now, just to say that this was interpreted in, in very different ways. Barfari, the, the New York critic, um, said that the Reliance in particular um, was scarcely more than a huge house of glass divided by horizontal and vertical lines of white enameled brick. That sounds sort of progressive to, to our ears, but Fari, of course, thought that this was an aesthetic crime. Um, more interesting maybe is uh, this architect with W.W. Boyington, a kind of old school uh, Chicago firm, who points out that, this, uh, that the plate glass on the Reliance and on the Fisher and on one or two other skyscrapers of the era made sense because plate glass, he said, was cheaper than brick. And this, I, I think, is, is a remarkable statement for a material that just a few years earlier uh, had really been a luxury material. So why does the Reliance stop being the model? Well, 
almost immediately uh, because the bricklayers find that they are being put out of a job by this combination of new materials. And even before the reliance is completed, but after it's permitted, um, it's permitted in 1891, it goes on site um, a little bit after 1893. Um, but even by then, the bricklayers had gotten their uh, hands into the city council and had uh, influenced a change in building code that was a step toward the more conservative codes of, of New York. They required all the walls to be a minimum of 12 inches thick. Uh, so not the, the progressively larger walls that Don showed, but a consistent uh, 12 inches thick for, for fireproofing reasons. And throughout the building, they required a minimum eight inches thickness of terracotta. So getting rid of the advantage that that thin terracotta had, and as Don said, the nominal size of, of an American standard brick is four inches. Note that all of these uh, are in multiples of four inches, right? So this, to my mind, circumstantially, I've, I've never been able to fully prove this, but this, to my mind, is the, the Bricklayers Union in particular sort of going to city council and legislating themselves back into a job. Um, the code also restricted the bay windows that the Reliance, for instance, had used to, to gain these very, very generous windows. And I think you see right away on Adler and Sullivan Stock Exchange building in 1896, permitted after the code had gone into effect, that the bay window is no longer the most effective way of deploying these large sheets of glass. Instead, what we now think of as the Chicago window the kind of infill between the, the jacketed mason or the jacketed steel frame becomes the way of getting more daylight and in the sides, uh, side uh, flanking windows in the Chicago window, uh, actual ventilation into the building as well. This is the formula under which Sullivan builds his kind of masterpiece, Carson Perry Scott. I, I like to think that there should be a, 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 a sort of shout out or a, a partial credit given to the Bricklayers Union, because this is essentially that new code, the formula of that new code, ornamented by Sullivan's great skill, but adhering very closely to the proportions uh, that are kind of left. Now, the price of glass goes back up again. The Trenton gas field is exhausted by 1899. Um, the, the glass industry and others use up all of the natural gas in Indiana and prices begin to rise again. But you can see too that electricity costs begin to fall and the daylighting that is so crucial to offices in the 1880s and 1890s is replaced gradually by electric lighting. And the second that uh, a new technology comes online, which is the, the, the tungsten filament bulb, uh, the second that that replaces carbon filaments, and you can see here patents that are uh, in 1912, but that reflect technology that goes back earlier. This is a 1908 catalog uh, from General Electric that advertises tungsten filaments as a replacement for the short-lived, very, very dim carbon filaments. And the moment this becomes economically viable and there is any other way than single thickness plate glass windows to illuminate uh, interior offices Chicago architects and builders in particular jump at the chance. And I would argue that the more solid curtain walls of this later era, here shown on the, the People's Gas Building on the left, the insurance exchange on the right, these are uh, climatically appropriate responses because Chicago's hot summers and very cold winters mean that those single glazed uh, plate glass windows on the Reliance make the buildings practically uninhabitable from a thermal point of view. And once tungsten light bulbs make electric lighting something that you can use all day, in addition to the evening hours or during inclement weather, um, the Chicago windows tighten right up and become these very small double hung windows that are more about ventilation and views uh, than they are about actually bringing in uh, daylight. So I will, uh, I'll leave it there um, and I will, um, invite Joanna back in to talk uh, to talk us through uh, the discussion phase and hopefully to, to give us uh, some things to, to begin um, to begin uh, comparing between uh, between New York and Chicago great um, thank you so much uh, Don and Tom um, just such fascinating material um, I guess 
the question that I'd like to ask to kick off discussion is um, something that we've chatted about before, is the role of labour costs as well as material costs. Um, you referred to this, um, Tom, in your discussion of the um, influence that the bricklayers um, tried to apply to getting building codes changed um, so that that would preserve um, some of their workload. Um, I've got a couple of questions. One is very specific and one is more general. Um, I guess my specific question in that particular instance is, and this is something that we don't talk about very much as architectural historians, skyscrapers are such a tiny, tiny, tiny proportion of the building that goes on in any city. Um, why were the bricklayers so concerned that they were being pushed out of high-rise commercial building construction when that was so small as a part of their general economy? Did they um, anticipate that more and more buildings would be built in this way, or was it a sort of a question of prestige that they wanted to be associated with these very high-profile buildings? That, that is a, a great question. And you're absolutely right that skyscrapers were a very uh, niche uh, market. Um, my guess is though that it had probably had something to do with uh, the fact that you, you basically had to use union labor downtown. And I'm not so sure that you would have had to on, in residential construction uh, further outside the, the, the central city. Um, I'm, I'm sure that it was the, the Bricklayers Union, which had been very prone to strikes in the 1880s and early 1890s in Chicago, that it was behind the, the, the code changes. And just thinking off the top of my head, I, I would guess that the more suburban uh, construction sites uh, probably were a little more liberal in their use of non-union uh, labor, or it was it was possible to use non-union labor outside uh, downtown without um, without actual violence happening, uh, which was a pretty regular occurrence um, in the in, in the 1880s. Um, that's my best guess. I think prestige probably entered into it uh, in part, um, and I also just I think that they would have been fighting for any market share they could have. Um, you know, there there weren't as many requirements for uh, fire resistant construction in the outlying areas. It was just in the fire district that Chicago's codes required brick construction. And so even though it was a small percentage of the, the city's overall uh, construction, it, brick was con certainly concentrated uh, downtown and in, in what was called the, the fire district. Yeah, so related to that is, um this comment that's often quoted from Henry Erickson in his book, 60 Years a Builder, talking about his experience in Chicago and then I think New York afterwards, where he makes the claim that it was actually um, an effort to crack down on the power and cost of bricklayers as a union that caused Chicago to um, explore these different construction methods. And I think that's fascinating coming from someone who's speaking from, you know, years of practical experience. How much, how much credit do you give to that comment? I, I, I think there's, I think there's some legitimacy to that. I, I'm not sure that it was, um, I'm not sure that it had the kind of agency that Erickson suggested did, but I think if you were a, an architect or a, a, a general contractor or a, a developer in the early 1890s, you would have looked at this new system and thought that, you know, not only did it get you more space because steel and terracotta takes up less space than masonry piers, but it does reduce the number of, of troublesome, you know, uh, unions on, on the site. And, you know, we know that, that uh, finance and, and labor have often been at odds in that way. So I think whether it was as influential as Erickson thinks it was, it certainly would have been an attractive option for reasons having to do both with efficiency uh, and with you know what's, what's euphemistically called job site harmony uh, in, in a lot of cases. Maybe Don, I can ask you to talk a little bit about why these, um, why these changes in material availability that had such a strong impact in New York, in Chicago, didn't have a similar impact in New York? I've been thinking about that as Tom was talking. Um, one issue is that uh, in the entire skyscraper era, uh, 
um, all of Manhattan Island or, or all of the settled portions of Manhattan Island were the fire district. Uh, so uh, there was a lot of required masonry work pretty much everywhere in New York. Um, and and uh, uh, through consolidation, through New York swallowing its nearby suburbs at the end of the century. Um, uh, but, uh, and, and, and many more buildings were not high rises, but mid rises. In other words, the, the standard low cost housing in New York in 1890 was a five story tenement. Uh, the equivalent in Chicago would be a two or three story building that was, that was mostly wood. Um, so there was just much more masonry work in general in New York as, as a percentage of total building. Um, and I think that, that, yeah, that would sound like it increases the power of the, the Masons, but it actually doesn't because they're no longer a bottleneck. Um, in Chicago, there's a relatively smaller number of Masons. They go on strike, they, they stop work. Whereas in New York, you could always find somebody willing to break the strike. Um, the other thing that came to mind listening to, to what both of you were saying was that uh, any anybody who thought they were going to break the power of labor by getting rid of the Masons um, would be very badly disappointed a few years later, later when they met the iron workers uh, because they, that was a heavily unionized and still is a heavily unionized trade. Um, so, and, and, and again, as a smaller percentage of the building trades would be a bottleneck and therefore has more power. Um, so I, it, it's, I, I have not gone into this in my research in depth, but I think that a lot of the differences have to do with sort of background construction. In other words, the, the general construction in a, in a city sets the tone for which trades have power and which, uh, and which are common uh, and which don't. Um, and the story in New York is that the carpenters lost out early on uh, as uh, the requirement for masonry walls became pretty much standard everywhere in the city. I mean, that does introduce an interesting social question, which is that, of course, Chicago in the 1890s was known as being famously corrupt um, in terms of its city administration. Um, and New York, perhaps slightly less so, but still, still pretty <laughs> corrupt. Um, you know, with the crackdown on city administration and the professionalization that went on around 1900, do you think the, the, the power of labor was diminished in either city or just expressed in different ways? Hmm. The, the, I, one thing I would say is that the, the, the concept of professionalism spread beyond, quote, the professions, unquote. So that uh, a lot of very loosey goosey construction in the 19th century starts to disappear in the early 20th century. Uh, better quality control, both from uh, private industry, meaning architects and engineers, and from the city. Um, so that th there's the, the concept of a mason saying, "I can build that wall half as half as much money as my competitors by using." half as much cement in his mortar, that starts to go away. It, that will never go away completely, but it, the, uh, uh, to use, uh, Carol mentioned earlier, I'd like to talk about industrialized construction, to use an industrial term that was very common in 1900, the rationalization of the construction process that takes place um, with the good government move, movement and the other changes after 1900, the, the creation of the ASTM making, uh, materials much more standard than they had been earlier. These things are all happening simultaneously. And I think that that uh, reduces the scope for people to save money in corrupt ways. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think that's fair. I, I think I, I'd also um, distinguish between, you know, actual corruption and uh, politics that that works in, in ways that, um, you know, may not be particularly attractive, but that, that ends up kind of working, right? And the, the, you can look at the, the bricklayer's influence on the 
code in, in a bunch of ways. And I'll talk more about Chicago's building code and its evolution uh, next week when we talk about fire. Um, but if you, know, if you think of building codes as, as these sort of scientific documents, then all of that influence seems kind of, um, seems sort of a little dangerous. But if you think about building codes and even things like standards documents as political documents, right? The building code is one of these places where actually, you know, politics is at work and it, it's at work in the right way. It's all of the sort of stakeholders, you know, people who want buildings to be safe, people who need jobs, you know, um, people who are, are interested in, in making money uh, by building buildings. All of those negotiations happen on the kind of table of, the, of, of these documents. And as much as we can sort of, um, you know, smirk at, at the, the sort of obvious political influence that the bricklayers had, I mean, I actually think that's an important way that, that these things get done. And when you look at how codes evolve, um, you know, they are places where these uh, political interests are all being sort of sort of hashed out, ultimately kind of successfully. I mean, the codes evolve both in terms of how the, the building science changes, you know, our understanding of what makes a safe building, uh, but also in terms of, you know, the, the interests that labor and, uh, and, and finance and, and all the other stakeholders kind of, kind of bring to it. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say that there was no corruption in Chicago or <laughs> in Chicago's building culture in, in the era. Um, but, but to me, the building code is a, a, an example of, um, kind of ugly but effective politics at, at, at work in a lot of ways. Yeah, that's a nice way of wrapping it up. I, can I just say, in terms of the revision of the modernist narrative about um, architecture and technology, I mean, I think what this conversation brings up is that the complete fallacy of the idea that a building can be a pure expression of technology because technology never exists alone. It always exists in a social construct, building codes, you know, contracts, all of these things. So, um, and each city, as you've shown, has its own um, recipe for, for um, manipulating technology. Um, so there is never a universal technology and there is never a, a a way in which technology just is itself. Yeah. There's a, an, an issue here, and actually, um, Darren von Stein has just put it up in the, uh, in the chat. When you're talking about a building code or a building culture, um, it's not just the people we think of as the players. It's not just whoever's writing the building code. It's not just the designers and the contractors. There, there are other parties that have an interest in this. One of them is the insurance companies. And next week, I, I know that when we're talking about fire, I'm gonna be talking about insurance companies a lot. Uh, they, they have an interest in not paying out. They want buildings to be safe, not because they're good people. They might be good people, they might not be, but they don't wanna pay out on their policies. Um, you have people who occupy the buildings who would like to not die. Uh, so you have different parties that don't necessarily agree on things um, somebody who's renting out space in the building doesn't really care what the first cost of the building was. They care what their current rent is. So if a little more money up front would make the building safer, they're all for it. Um, I, I think that uh, the, the, what this gets to is that they only know what's going on at that time. And for example, one place that everybody got things wrong was egress. And that the Triangle Fire did a nice job of exposing that, that all of the progress that had been made for fire control um, prior to 1910 wasn't good enough. And it wasn't good enough in a specific manner, which is it didn't address egress properly. Um, one of the problems, to, to, to come back to this week's topic, um, those great details I put up about how to support terracotta worked really good for the first 60 or 80 years of a building's life. And then they're problematic. Well. Honestly, people in, 19, in 1890 weren't sure that these buildings were still going to be around in 80 years. And they certainly weren't going to plan, they didn't have any way to plan for how to fix them or how to take them apart. Um, so I, I'm agreeing with Tom's point here that building codes are not a, a, you know, a pure expression of uh, what's best for building technology. They're an expression of what people think is best at the time in compromise. And that's something very different. Yes, that's a good, I think that's a good way to put it. Yeah. 
Yeah, can I also um, make the point and also introduce in our last five minutes that we have of, the, of this hour, um, another question, but to, ma to make the point that, that many of these buildings were experiments um, in the introduction of terracotta at eight, 792 feet in the Woolworth building, which famously had terracotta that cracked within the, the first months of, um, of it, its installation. So um, thinking about the facade as, a, as a, a part of the budget of the overall building, uh, um, I wonder if you have any um, you know, um, data to draw on or how one even begins to research these ideas about you know, what, was the, what was the value added of, of a, um, a high quality facade versus not just a thin curtain wall, but something which projected a different idea. McKim, we need in White's, you know, ostensible um, historicism and the overlays and the, and the, the ornament which was bespoke um, for individual buildings. What, how much, how much did that cost and what was its value? Um, additionally, how much did the facade cost compared to the steel and, and the foundations and the other aspects of, of construction? Um, Don, I, I know you've looked as much as anybody into these individual, kind of to parse these individual expenses. Could you comment on any of those? Uh, unfortunately, I don't remember the numbers exactly. <laughs> but uh, the difference between a plain facade by 1900 standards, which is very different from a plain facade by our standards today, and an ornate facade by 1900 standards wasn't that much in terms of money. Um, if you're building a, ma a masonry facade, and I'm gonna to speak to New York here, if you're building a masonry facade that has to be a certain thickness, uh, the, the difference in mason's skill and time and materials to put more ornament on the outside the veneer really just wasn't that much. It was, uh, it was something on the order of 10 or 15% of the cost of the facade, which is obviously well under half the cost of the building. It's not, a, a, not the, the largest cost in, in constructing the building. Um, so whether or not that was worthwhile, I think was not so much done off of uh, expenses. Um, a lot of the a lot of the cost of a building was the interior finishes. Um, when I looked at this, it was what I was doing was comparing industrial buildings where the interiors were not only very plain, they were largely open. In other words, you don't have a lot of interior finishes because you don't have a lot of interior partitions. And comparing that to a very, very highly ornamental interior like a hotel, uh, and there there's a huge cost difference. And it is entirely the cost of the interior finishes and the interior partitions. Um, so the, I mean, even today, the cost of the structure of a skyscraper is just not necessarily that big relative to the overall cost. Uh, the cost of a curtain wall today is relatively lower because our curtain walls are much simpler than the curtain walls that Tom and I both described. Uh, Joanna, maybe you want to ask some, uh, a couple of final questions as we uh, inch beyond. Uh, yeah, I, I'd, I'd love to, I think at the risk of opening up a whole other mm -hmm question that maybe you need a new session on and I don't know if I can use an F word maybe fresh air is a, is a word um, Tom you mentioned briefly the role of environmental conditioning um, and that's a whole other technology that we could have a whole session on um, in in this period uh, you know maybe ending in like 1910 how much is that a concern Oh, it's it's still uh, incredibly important. The the people's gas slide that I showed, you know, there is still a light court there, but it's no longer about illuminating the building. That's the that's the summer air conditioning system essentially um, is is keeping the buildings narrow enough that you can open windows and transoms over doors and, and get cross ventilation. And it's still another generation after people's gas that um, before air conditioning becomes viable as a, as a way to cool uh, office building and interiors. Um, so the, the ventilation remains important both for uh, windows 
uh, but also for the for the massing of, of, of the building. And, and you're right, this is another, like, Carol, can we go for another hour or two? Because <laughs> I think this is one of the most important stories of the early 20th century is how environmental systems become, you know, almost as influential to the way buildings are massed and the way skins are configured uh, as the, the, the structure and skin that, that, that we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. Absolutely. And, and again, this gets at the kind of um, futility of talking about these um, building types as universal, because obviously yeah. New York and Chicago are rather similar in terms of their environment. Um, but these types get built all over the country and all over the world in very, very different environmental conditions. I'm going to pass back to you, Carol, because I see the time is ticking over to uh, 11. It is. And since we've now um, hit the uh, seven and a half hour mark uh, in the whole of this, the Tom and Don series, and there's still uh, 90 minutes to go uh, before we add the coda of uh, Alexander Wood to the, to the case study of, a, of another New York building, um, we have certainly... Um, put the put the skin on the on the skeleton, uh, but we have once again uh, complicated every aspect of, uh, of of its understanding. So uh, I I'm not sure where we're going next week in terms of a fire, but I'm I'm sure that the territory is going to be new and unfamiliar to a lot of us on the uh, on on the call and, and in our our various disciplines. So once again, um, Tom and Don, thank you so much for um, making our lives both uh, richer, but also less clear in, uh, in seeing, um, uh, seeing a kind of narrative history that was all too um, reductive um, and oversimplified and tendentious, and, uh, as w uh, which we now make contentious, uh, as, uh, as Joanna has also uh, um, explained to us tonight. So we will resume um, next week, next Tuesday, as we look at fires and codes. Um, and we'll ask you all to present questions too um, into the chat or into an email to the Skyscraper Museum, I guess at um, programs at skyscraper.org, so that we can think about how we do begin to, to integrate these um, parts of the building uh, into um, not one story, maybe probably not two stories that help us to understand construction history in New York, but, but into some kind of coherent um, uh, argument about where uh, where the, the, the forces that come together in order to shape buildings, a building and buildings in the city um, have, their, have their, their consistent characteristics that help us to understand both buildings and place. So um, in that continuing search, uh, tune in next week. And um, thank you again, Tom and Don and Joanna for this evening for uh, a really terrific set of, of talks and questions. So see you next time, everybody. Thanks. <laughs> Bye.